Beyond Boundaries, How the Gospel Transcends Cultural Differences, a reflection by Timothy Keller. Acts 8, 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandeki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The book of Acts records the earliest beginnings of Christianity following Christ's return to heaven. It teaches us about the character of the earliest Christians and how the power of God overturned the world. And the more I consider this story of Philip and the Ethiopian, the more I regard it with amazement. This passage brings to mind a single line in a poem by George Herbert, a 17th century poet. It goes like this, Bibles laid open, millions of surprises. No matter who you are, the Bible will surprise you. No matter what your culture or class is, no matter what preconceptions you bring to the Bible, it will confront them. This is a surprising, category-shattering text. I'd like to look at it through three different principles it teaches us. For starters, it tells us about the inclusivity of Christianity. Secondly, it tells us about the exclusive exclusivity of Christianity. Finally, we learn the reasoning and grounding for both. Most people say, well, you're either inclusive or exclusive. But the fact is that Christianity is radically inclusive and radically exclusive. It can be both because it is both. The inclusivity of Christianity. We're told the main figure in the story is an Ethiopian eunuch. At that time, Ethiopia referred to the Upper Nile region of Africa from as far north as Aswan and as far south as Khartoum. Today, we call it Nubia. Furthermore, he was a eunuch. He had been castrated. For people in his position, that was common. If you weren't part of the royal family, but you were being groomed for, an administrative, for administrative leadership in government and were in close proximity with royal family members, the price was castration. It removed temptation on the part of the administrator and suspicion on the part of the royal family, but at a terrible cost. Right away, we noticed two things. First, how different the two people are in this story. Philip was a middle-class Jewish man. This man in the chariot was black. He was from the outermost part of the known civilized world. He was sexually altered. From the view of Philip's culture, this man would have been considered a racially different, sexually altered barbarian, as different from Philip as possible. In those days, Jewish men got up every day and prayed, O oh Lord, I thank you that you didn't make me a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. They were told, you don't want to associate with people who are different from you because it defiles you. Yet the Ethiopian was about as different from Philip as a person could be. The second thing to notice is how direct God's intervention had to be in order for this connection to be made. In verse 26, an angel of the Lord told Philip to go to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Secondly, verse 29 says that when he sees the Ethiopian, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. Do you know why the spirit had to say, go to the chariot and stay near it? Because it was moving. He had to run. He wasn't invited into the chariot until verse 31. So who knows how long he had to jog along before he was noticed. Up until then, he must have been running alongside, waiting to see what God had in mind. Then the eunuch invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Have you ever wondered why he would do that? He picked up a guy who wasn't even hitchhiking. Once he was inside, Philip immediately sees on a commonality that unites men who are seemingly very different, the Bible. 
he saw the Ethiopian was reading scripture and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? This was not the usual way chance encounters on the road unfolded. Bear in mind that this meeting never would have happened unless the Spirit had said to go and run alongside. And we're told at the very end in verse 39 that as soon as the baptism happened, the Spirit took Philip. We don't know quite how he did it, but it's a word that literally means seize. The Spirit seized Philip and took him away. By every measure, this was a divine encounter. Every single aspect of it happened because of divine intervention. We can learn two important things from the way this was set up. First of all, the Spirit of God strongly desires for racial barriers between people to be surmounted. It's one of the most obvious themes throughout the book of Acts. Over and over again, the Spirit stirs Christians to break barriers, get out of their comfort zone, and embrace people of different races, cultures, and locations. The Bible talks about the Spirit being grieved if we don't love what God loves. This must mean it grieves God when Christians of one race show disdain for or ignore people of other races, temperaments, classes, and cultures. It grieves the Spirit. We must listen to the voice of the Spirit, friends. Here it is. Philip, run up to that racially different, physically altered man you would ordinarily have nothing to do with, and stay close. That's the trajectory of the Spirit in the whole book of Acts, and it's still the trajectory of the Spirit. The Spirit of God desires that racial, economic, and personal barriers be surmounted, and it begins by making the effort. You think it was easy keeping up with a horse-drawn chariot? To stay close. To begin with, don't talk. Don't push yourself on anyone. Wait to be invited in and just stay close. Secondly, the other thing we learn here is that Christianity does not belong to one culture more than another. Over and over in the book of Acts, we say non-Jews getting converted. First, Samaritans were converted. Though they were geographically close, Samaritans were racially alienated by the Jews because the two groups hated each other. Now a black African gets converted, someone who's not just racially different, but also geographically from the far reaches of the then known world. Later in the book, we see a Jewish Pharisee getting converted by the gospel. Then, Romans get converted by the gospel. Over and over again, the book of Acts fails to favor one culture as the one to which Christianity belongs more than to, more to than another. During Jesus' ascension into heaven, Luke 24 states that he gave his followers this command. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Matthew records the same occasion in chapter 28, saying, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Do you know how that puts the Bible into direct conflict with the ordinary understanding of how culture and religion relate? Today, most colleges or schools will teach that religion is just an extension or a function of culture. It's not unusual for students to hear something along the lines of this. Religion is an invention of culture because every culture needs solidarity. In every culture, people need cohesiveness based on shared customs and values to keep that culture together. One of the ways to do that is to spin out these metaphysical, spiritual stories that become religion. So, Europeans and North Americans develop Christianity. South Asian cultures develop Hinduism. Far Eastern cultures developed Buddhism, Confucius, Confucianism, and Shintoism, and the Middle Eastern, North African, and some South Asian cultures developed Islam. Every culture develops a religion as an extension of itself, and that's all religion is. Laman Sana, an African professor at Yale and a Christian, wrote a terrific little book some years ago called Whose Religion is Christianity? The Gospel Beyond the West. He points out that if you look at where the population centers are for the major world, Religions, their population centers are still roughly near where they started, except for Christianity. The majority of other religions' adherents are still located in the cultures where those religions were developed. For example, 88% of Buddhists live in East Asia, and 98% of Hindus live in India or South Asia. This does, of course, play into the theory that religion is just an extension of culture. But Sana points out that Christianity is absolutely different. It's the only worldwide religion. 26% of Christians are in Europe. 25% are in Latin America and the Caribbean, 24% are in Africa, and 13% are in Asia. But that number is growing very fast. Only 12% of all the Christians in the world are in North America. Korea went from 0% of a Christian population to having about 40 or 50% of one in 40 or 50% of one in about 100 years. China, which is quite which is quite a bit bigger than Korea, by the way, is doing the same thing right now over a hundred-year period. That's the reason I said the percentage of Christians in Asia is growing very rapidly. 
Africa went from being about 9% Christian to 50% Christian in 100 years. No other religion has ever spread across the continents like Christianity has. It's just never happened before. In fact, Richard Bauckham, a scholar at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, says, Almost certainly, Christianity exhibits more cultural diversity than any other religion, and that must say something about it. Absolutely, it says something about it. Why is it that Christianity is far more inclusive of cultural diversity than any other religion and, therefore, really the only worldwide and culturally diverse religion? Sana gives an example from the African perspective. He tells us to consider this. Africans have always believed the world was a supernatural place. They've always believed the world was filled with spirits, both good and evil. That's at the heart of what it means to be an African. But what is one to do about the evil spirits? They're powerful. They can seduce you over to evil and dominate you. How does someone avoid this? Many environments that espouse inclusivity still find themselves ill-equipped to answer cultural concerns like these. For example, Sana says if an African goes off to a secular country or a secular school, such as Oxford, Yale, Princeton, or the like, these places will usually tell them, oh, we're very inclusive, we're multicultural, we're very happy for you to eat your African food and wear your African dress. But out of the same mouth, they will also tell them there are no spirits. There are no demons, no angels, none of that stuff. Everything has a scientific explanation. In other words, Sana states, they say, we really love your culture, we're just going to take the heart out of it. You still have to become a late modern, secular, individualistic Westerner like us, or you're not enlightened. That's not ex inclusive, that's exploitative. But, as Sana also says, when Christianity comes to Africa, it goes like this. Christianity challenges and yet accepts Africanness. It says, on the one hand, you're right, the world is a supernatural place. There are a lot of good spirits and evil spirits. But there is one who has overcome the evil spirits, Jesus Christ. And through him, you can overcome them too. Sana says that, it, that, Sana says that affirms Africanness and yet renews it. Africans sensed in their hearts that Jesus did not mock their respect for the sacred or their clamor for an invincible savior. So they beat their sacred drums for him until the stars skipped and danced in the skies. After that dance, the stars weren't little anymore. Christianity helps, helped Africans to become renewed Africans, not remade Europeans. In other words, Christianity is far more inclusive than secularism, which always talks about inclusiveness. Christianity does not just belong to this culture or that culture. It's not an extension, function, or product of culture. It comes down from above. It stands over all culture, and it's the job of the Holy Spirit to recreate Christianity in the soil of every culture. Christianity is, therefore, the most inclusive of all religions, even more inclusive than secularism. The exclusivity of Christianity. This point is shorter, and I'll tell you why. If you live in an environment that values inclusivity, you're probably getting this good feeling from all this talk of inclusion. Just hearing the word inclusive is enough to make the average Manhattanite feel warm and fuzzy inside. To actually see empirical evidence that Christianity is the religion most inclusive of cultural differences just has a nice feel to it, doesn't it? But if you want to understand why Christianity is more culturally inclusive than secularism or than other religions, you need to see how it's exclusive. The reason this is a short point is that it probably doesn't take as many arguments to make the case that Christianity makes exclusive claims. You can see them right here. For example, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the scroll of Isaiah when he asked Philip, what does this text mean? In verse 34, obviously Philip did not respond in a postmodern literary theoretical way. He didn't say, you have to create the meaning of the text for yourself. You have to decide what is right or wrong for you. I can't tell you. He told him that Jesus is the hermeneutical and interpretive principle that makes sense of everything in the Bible. He told him the gospel. Then the eunuch asked, why shouldn't I be baptized? By asking to be baptized, the man proclaimed his conversion and his faith in Jesus and his intention to identify with the people of God. Baptism means one way of life is over and a new way of life begins. Baptism means I stop believing that and I start believing this. I stop living that way and I start living this way. He has converted. He wasn't told, well, you have to serve God and find God in whatever way is most meaningful for you. So while you can make a case that Christianity is the most culturally inclusive religion out there, you can also say it's the most exclusive religion. If it's more inclusive than other religions, it's more exclusive as well. How's that? Well, every other religion has a founder who is basically a prophet or a sage or a wise teacher saying, here's how to get to God. The image often invoked is that every religion is a different path up to the top of the mountain, but we're all going to the same God. Buddhists say the way to God is to follow the Eightfold Path, and Muslims say the way to God is to practice the Five Pillars. They might seem 
to teach different practices, but allegedly they're all going to arrive at God at the top of the mountain, each through their own effort and adherence to various teachings. But they're different paths to the top. They're different paths to the top, but everyone has to hike to the top by their own effort. Except Christianity. As we often say, Jesus Christ does not say, I'm here to show you how to find God. Jesus Christ says, I am God, and I've come to find you. You'd never get to the top of the mountain by yourself. I've come because I am the God you're seeking. If that is true, then Christianity is either better than the rest of the world's religions, or it's worse, because then Jesus would have told the world's biggest lie. It either has to be better than the rest, or worse than the rest. It can't be anything else. Isn't this ironic? Isn't this paradoxical? It means Christianity is the most worldwide, the most culturally diversive, the most inclusive culturally, yet most exclusive in its claims. How does that work? The reason for both. Understanding this supposed paradox comes down to understanding this story, and the way you get into the heart of the story is asking a question. One of the best ways to understand a story is to ask it the right question, and then let it answer. The question we'll ask is this, why is the Ethiopian reading the scroll of Isaiah so intently? This man had gone all the way from his kingdom to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Why in the world would he do that? First of all, let's think about who he was. He was head of the queen's treasury. He had virtually reached the top. In today's terms, he was the CFO of his country. In fact, he had more power than the United States Secretary of the Treasury has today. He had power and success. But let's remember that he made a huge sacrifice by becoming a eunuch. And this was in a time when one's descendants were of critical importance. The ancient cultures were not as individualistic as we are today. Today, most people measure their self-worth mainly by their own achievements, but back then, self-worth came from the standing of your family. You only had honor and pride if your family's standing was good. You had no way of having any kind of legacy unless you had children. Your sons and daughters were your legacy. Yet here was a man who sacrificed all of that in order to get power. He had given up the idea of having a family in a completely family-dominated culture. Among other things, that meant loneliness. So... Why would a man take a thousand-mile journey to leave his culture, its religion, and his post? This was a position, by the way, that could have been jeopardized by taking a thousand-mile, year-long trip. The possibility of someone usurping your place would have been pretty good, not to mention how dangerous such a lengthy journey could be. The answer is there must have been an enormous emptiness in him. His own religion couldn't fill it. All of his power and success couldn't fill it. Why else would he get interested in the God of the Bible? wonder if there was something for him in Jerusalem, and go all the way to the temple. Here's one thing we know. When he got to the temple, after all that travel, all that sacrifice, they wouldn't have let him in. The temple and all its worship was regulated by Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, which is still a little bit of a puzzle to modern readers, had all of these rules about who could get into the temple and worship God and who could not. For example, if you touched a dead body, you were excluded from the temple for a certain amount of time. If you had mold in your house, you were excluded. Why? All of these rules were put in place to get a spiritual idea across. It was often missed, but the idea was that God is holy and we are sinful and shouldn't just walk right into God's dwelling place without being cleansed. Something needed to be done about sin. All of those rules and regulations were like visual aids to try to get that across. But some of the rules permanently excluded people. One of the rules was that those who had been castrated could never go in and worship God. By that logic, the Ethiopian likely went to all this trouble just to find himself excluded and left outside. You can imagine the disappointment. So, why does he still decide to pour over the book of Isaiah on his way home? Perhaps a clue lies in which part of the Bible the Ethiopian was reading. The text quoted in the passage is from Isaiah 53. So he was reading the chapters in the 40s and 50s called the Servant Songs. In chapter 56, which isn't very far from where he was reading, he would have seen this. Let no foreigner say, the Lord will exclude me from his people, and let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give a name better than sons and daughters, an everlasting name that will never be cut off. Can you imagine his reaction? He would have sat there saying, wait a minute, I don't know of any way to pass on my name except through sons and daughters. What is this everlasting name that will never be cut off? He's being told in his own cultural terms that there is a salvation that goes beyond not only power and success, but also family. As he's reading, he suddenly realizes there is this strange and enigmatic figure called the servant all throughout this part of the scripture. 
hence why it's referred to as the servant songs. God keeps calling someone my servant, and this person is suffering. Do you realize why a eunuch would be looking at this passage? Let's take another look at the specific verse he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Did you notice the part about descendants? In these verses, someone is voluntarily ending their family line, much like a eunuch does, and becoming a, becoming a lamb to be slain. In fact, if you go a little farther, Isaiah 53, 8 says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his, de his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. As the Ethiopian sat there wondering who on earth this person is, Philip came up and offered to help him understand what he was reading. He turned to him right away and asked, Is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Philip told him that, yes, the prophet was talking about someone very, very, very else. Someone absolutely unique. It's Jesus Christ, born in a manger, who died on the cross. I can imagine Philip telling his new friend something like this. Jesus became the lamb who was slain. Jesus became like a leper for the lepers. He became like a eunuch for the eunuch. In other words, Jesus Christ was excluded. Don't you see, oh my new friend, the Mosaic law was just pointing to a spiritual truth? We're all like eunuchs. We're all excluded from the presence of God. Because of our sins, nobody loves God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. Nobody loves their neighbor as themselves. Nobody can go in. We all deserve to be excluded and to be lost. But Jesus Christ was excluded on the cross in place of us. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced the God forsakenness that we deserve. He was excluded so we could be brought in. He was made unclean so we could be cleansed. We could never, ever cleanse ourselves and be good enough on our own. But Jesus Christ has done it for us. That's the good news of Jesus. Now here's a question. Why is the most inclusive religion the most exclusive? And why would the exclusivity of Christianity bring about this inclusiveness? First, let's look at what Christianity does. Do you understand why Christianity would be more culturally flexible? What if salvation was like this? God came down as a general and said, anyone who obeys everything I tell them will be blessed and successful. Salvation would be from a strong God to strong people. Summon up your strength and be as obedient as you possibly can be. If salvation were only given to the strong by the strong, Christianity would be a religion of nothing but laws. You would want to be completely compliant because you're only blessed and successful if you're absolutely obedient. Christianity would even tell you what to eat and how to dress and everything. For you to become a Christian, you would have to completely leave behind your culture. That's not the salvation of the gospel. What is that salvation? The deepest revelation of the nature of God is on the cross. God's greatest glory is seen in how he was willing to lose all of his glory. His greatest beauty is that he was willing to lose his beauty. He became weak. He died and rose again to take our punishment and the divine wrath. It was the only way to forgive us, the only way to save us, and the only way to someday end evil without ending us. Therefore, the idea of weakness is central to the heart of Christianity. That means Christianity is not a relativistic religion. There is a universal standard of morality that all cultures must follow. But Christianity also isn't just a religion of truth. It's a religion of truth spoken in love. Even though there are norms, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. There's a softness and a hardness about Christianity. Therefore, it makes perfect sense that Christianity is so flexible because salvation is not through law keeping, it's through grace. When we become a Christian, our identity changes, giving us new ability to overcome our old barriers of exclusivity. For example, if you get your self-worth from being a hard-working person, you likely look down on people you consider lazy. If you get your self-worth from being an emotionally intuitive person, you probably don't like rationalistic people who may seem cold to you. And if you get your self-worth from being a rational, reasonable person, you may brush off the concerns of the emotionally, emotionally intuitive. In other words, if you accomplish your own salvation, if your self-image is based on something you achieve, you will tend to look down at other cultures, other classes, other vocational groups, other kinds of people, and other temperaments. But the gospel doesn't start with strength or accomplishing your own salvation. It starts with weakness. It says God gives you a true salvation you can only receive when you humble yourself and admit your need. Christianity is not for the strong. It's for the people who know they're not. It's for those who admit they're weak. 
and then receive it by grace and are affirmed to the skies and valued by God's love. You can't feel superior to anybody, and that's what breaks through cultural barriers. The key to it all is this. At the heart of the Bible is Jesus, God become man. The Spirit didn't just bring Philip to this meeting. The Spirit also directed this Ethiopian politician to the text, which is perhaps the heart of the whole Bible, because it is about substitutionary sacrifice. Everything in the Bible points to how our salvation is not something we accomplish, and how Jesus Christ took our place as our substitute and did what was required to save us. The Bible sometimes talks about what Jesus did in the language of the battlefield. He fought the powers of sin and death for us. Sometimes it's the language of the marketplace. He paid our debt. Sometimes it's the language of the temple. He gave the ultimate sacrifice so we can be cleansed and acceptable in God's sight. Sometimes it's the language of the law court. He stood in our place and took our judgment and paid our penalty. And running through every single one of all those different vocabularies is substitution. The most compelling, most life-changing, most wonderful kind of story is one about someone dying to save other people. Years ago, when the last Harry Potter novel was about to come out and everyone was wondering how in the world J.K. Rowling would bring it all to a conclusion, I always knew, though nobody believed me. I knew Harry had to die for his friends in order to save them. Why? Because there is no more compelling, wonderful, transforming storyline. If you know somebody has done it for you, nothing changes you more than that. Some of you may know my favorite story from Charles Dickens is A Tale of Two Cities. At the famous conclusion, Sidney Carton breaks into the dungeon where his rival, who looks like him, is about to be guillotined. Carton smuggles this man, Charles Darnay, out of the prison and takes his place. He substitutes himself for the condemned man. The 1935 film starring Ronald Coleman brings out the Christian themes beautifully. There are other prisoners around, including a young seamstress waiting to be executed too. She sees the man she thought was Darnay, looks at him, and realizes he's someone else. She asks him, are you dying for him? He replies, and his wife and child. In the 1935 film, she says something akin to, stranger, I don't think I can face my own death, but maybe if I hold the hand of someone as brave as you, I'll be able to do it. He agrees, and they go to the guillotine together. She was transformed and strengthened by his substitutionary sacrifice, and it wasn't even for her. How much more will you become an agent for the spread of the gospel, for a life of sacrifice, for giving yourself up so that others may live? How much more transformed will you be if you grasp God's substitutionary sacrifice for you and base your life on it? Father, thank you for sending Jesus to make the ultimate sacrifice for us. As we seek to build your church as Christians did in the book of Acts, we ask that you guide us toward encounters like Philip and the Ethiopian. Help us to display the radical inclusivity and exclusivity of your story in a compelling and life-changing way to those around us, rather than ignoring those of different races, temperaments, economic statuses, or cultures. Help us to live as loving witnesses to them until we are invited to share the good news of the gospel and delight in the common ground it holds for all of us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.